نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحج حج محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار All praise belongs to Allah We praise him, we seek his forgiveness and his guidance We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of our own egos and the evil results of our deeds. Anyone whom Allah guides, then no one can lead him astray. And anyone whom Allah leaves to stray, then there is none that can guide him. And I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship and no gods except Allah, who stands alone and has no partners. Unclick your fingers. And I bear witness that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is his slave and his final messenger. Allah says what could mean, O you who believe, fear Allah as it is his right to be feared, and don't you dare die except that you die as Muslims. He also said what could mean, O mankind, fear your Lord, the one who created you all from one soul, Adam, and created from that soul its mate, Eve, and raised up and spread from the two of those individuals many men and women, the billions and billions upon people that we see now. And fear Allah, the one whom you ask things for, and don't cut ties with the wombs that bore you. Indeed, Allah above you all is laying in watch. This laying in watch means like someone in an ambush, you know, waiting to attack, and you don't notice that you're in You've walked into a trap. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, O you who believe, fear Allah, and in light of your fear of Allah, say a word that goes straight to the point. If you do this, he will make right for you something you did wrong. He will rectify your deeds and forgive you of your sins. And anyone who is already obeying Allah and obeying his messenger has already achieved the highest aspirations anyone could ever hope to achieve. As for what follows, then everyone, every Muslim has to know and realize that the best speech is the speech of Allah. And the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the most evil of affairs are those things that we ourselves introduce into the religion. And we say that over and over again, not to be uh, cliche, but to be redundant and to make and hopefully one day drive the point home that the most evil of affairs are the things that we're coming up with. It's not things in Islam. It's things that we come up with. And every one of those things that we invent 
and we put into the mixture, so to speak, or into the calculation, are things that lead us astray. And every one of these things that lead us astray, no matter how novel the idea, and that's why we say the word is an innovation, you know, some nice new idea we come up with, it eventually leads us to the hellfire. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, I was trying to wait for the brothers to finish offering the salah so we don't disturb them. Ramadan is, is we say, Qadaqamati Salah, right? We say that, Qadaqamati Salah, the Salah, we've established the Salah, we've already established the Salah. And when do we say that? Do we say that after the Salah? We say it right before the Salah. So we learn the word Qad in the Arabic language when it's used by a human, it could mean taqrib, meaning something is so close it's here. You know, like if someone shows up, they haven't entered the house, but you said he's here. Could you see him driving up? You know, Ramadan is here. Could jaat Ramadan, if you understand what I mean. It's here now. And we have only a few moments. Last year when I was going to come here, we spoke about, they had talked about time was going to be the theme. And I said to myself, well, once I realized that I wasn't unable to come, that time is, is, is a very strange thing. It, it, it changes from person to person. We both could sit here for an hour. And because of what Allah has put in time and that example for all of us, it might feel like a long time for one and a few seconds for someone else. Right? What one person might be able to do in an hour, another person might be able to do in 10 minutes because of the way Allah allows that time to feel. And so the anxious, I know I feel very anxious about Ramadan being here because it's a new opportunity, another opportunity for us to do something right, okay? And if we do it right, we might be able to get and receive that, not we might, we will receive the reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for us. Alhamdulillah, the brothers for the most part are done. I asked the brother to unclick his fingers. Everyone should know and remember that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam nahana Rasulullah. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam forbade us to tashbik al to stick our fingers together like this or like you know like this in the masjid. Okay, khasam because anytime you're in a masjid, it's between the salah. And he said the reason why. He said that the shaitan he sits on these fingers. When you put them together like this, he sits on them. So we don't know. We can't see that. We don't know how the shaitan does that. Or why doing this makes the shaitan or allows the shaitan to do it. But we do believe in the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that everything he came to us. So we don't do that. It goes so far that some of the ulama, they used to prevent us in the halaqat al-ilm, even in the circles of knowledge, from doing this so we would never get into the habit of doing it and so you see people going like this or like this or doing other things in order not to put their fingers together i'm of the uh opinion of not to do it at all so that we don't get in a habit because you know preacher we're creatures of habit and everything like that so if you see a brother it is a serious thing because you don't want him to be the shaitan to be standing on him right somebody be saying well that's petty no Allah's Messenger said not to do it. He gave us a really good reason not to do it. Even if he hadn't told us the reason not to do it, we know not to do it. And I don't mean that against the, 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 the brothers that do it by accident, because I do it by accident also. Yes, sir? You know, when we, what we ask, we answer the people like that. If they have to ask, then they shouldn't be worried about it. You know, because it's in the Quran, it's, I mean, it's in the uh, Quran where it says, وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوا Allah says in the Quran, whatever the Messenger وسلم, gives you, then take it. And then we say it's in the Kutub al -Sitta. You know, and when you read, if you read Bukhari and Muslim in these books, you'll find it in those books of Hadith right there. I don't know the exact um, book exactly where they could find it. But don't, you know, and I know we always talk about everybody has to bring the delil. This is true. But three days without reading makes conversation like dry, it loses its flavor. 
if we were doing our, our job reading more, we'd find these things all over the place. You know, so it's not really, I used to ask the shiuch, what ayah is that? They would say in the Quran. And they would never give us the answer. You read, you'll find it, inshallah ta'ala. No disrespect at all. But it's, a, it's a, you know, very easily found. I don't know what um, book to point to exactly, okay? But I would check in the book on, on the adab of the masjid and stuff like that. And there's an excellent book called uh, Manahi Sharia. You know, those things that have been uh, prohibited in the Sharia by Sheikh uh, Al Halali, and it'd probably be in that one also. Also, the other thing I wanted to do is mention here Ramadan. That's what we were talking about initially. We'll go back to the subject. Alhamdulillah. For the children, Ramadan is, should be especially a joyful period. I remember myself when I was a non Muslim, or when even I was bef after I became Muslim, and I didn't know about you know, Ramadan, because certain things you learn time and time again, and certain things you don't learn until you get into the environment of the Muslims. And I used to get so hyped up when it was time for Christmas or uh, after Thanksgiving around that time. And alhamdulillah, that transferred over to Islam. So what we want to do is we want to make the environment suitable for the Muslim children. There's a poem. It's a very beautiful poem in my estimation, maybe because I wrote it. And <laughs> it's called When Doors in Heaven Open Wide and it's for children to teach them the uh, Ramadan When doors in heaven open wide and hell is locked devils inside when Sha'ban month strikes 29 the Muslims search the sky to find the Ramadan new moon approach with taqwa blessings and good hopes so if they sight the moon, we fast. And when it's cloudy, 30 pass. From Sha'ban before Ramadan, the month of fasting and Quran, the month we pray the Tarawih and wake up early when we sleep. The Sunnah is to eat and drink a light suhoor for Fajr's brink. And then from sunrise till it sets, we fast and leave all nourishment. It's what strong Muslims have to do, obligating me and you to intend the night before a day of fasting for your Lord. But for the traveler or the sick, this obligation doesn't stick. And girls, when menses come your way, you must stop fasting right away. And those that make themselves throw up or sneak and eat, they should grow up. Because those are two dumb, dirty tricks that break a fast you'll have to fix. Allah don't need us not to eat if we still lie and act like creeps. When you're fasting, play it cool and don't respond to every fool. But if somebody gets disturbs your vibe, I'm fasting twice is our reply. Remember not to sleep all day or talk too much with too much play. Then soon as you can't see the sun, from way up high, your fast is done. The devil loses and we win. Oh Allah, forgive our sins. The thirst is gone, the veins are wet. We hope that the reward is set. Like this we pray before we eat. Then bismillah to start the feast. First with dates or water if there is no dates to start it with. When no water, eat a sweet. But do not wait to start to eat. And if you're fasting, took a break for sickness or for travel's sake, just make it up some other day. And if you don't, you got to pay. This brief poem was written for children, even though adults are caught listening. And each line is in it some ishara for the children. Why is it the purpose of this poem? Anybody tell me? What's the, why do we think that we put this together for the children? Yes, since you had your hand on your leg. Yes. <laughs> no. Yes. Well, that's true, yes. 
right? Because it's catchy and it's easy to remember for both reasons. We have to become wiser in to see how long you can hang your hands in the air. And there's a mistake here from the intellectual point of view that sometimes a person thinks that his dua is going to have a greater effect on the ma'moon, on the people, the congregation, than the salah did. The reciting of the Qur'an is going to have the best and the greatest effect on the hearts and the eyes of the people than anything else. And no one's dua can compete with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we shouldn't. The Prophet sallallahu didn't make speeches as long as some of these dua. So we should make sure the dua is something that the people can handle by holding up their hands. And remember as the Prophet sallallahu he told Mu'adh, when Mu'adh led the salah, not even held the hands up, led the salah a long time, he got mad and his face turned red and he sallallahu said, Afatan anta ya Mu'adh? Are you a fitna maker ya Mu'adh? When you lead the salah, use the small salah. And this is what it the small swar, the, the short surah. Because you have with you the women, the children, and those people who have needs, the weak, the old. And we know everybody comes out during Ramadan. So it's not wrong for you to encourage the, the, the da'i or the, the qari to keep it what is handleable, ha able to be handled by the small children and the elder ladies and the older men and the people that, you know, can't hold their hands up that long and not even make that the point to see how long they can hold their hand up. With taqwa blessings and the hope they stay tight to move we fast and if it's cloudy 30 past from Sha'ban before Ramadan, the month of fasting and Quran, the month we pray the tarawih and wake up early when we sleep. I said when we sleep because sometimes during Ramadan, people stay up afterwards and do offer more salah or do more reading of the Quran but it's enough if you just prayed with the Imam to the end because if you prayed with the Imam to the end you get the reward as if you've prayed the whole night and there's another encouragement for the Imam to keep it short in the witr so people want to because what happens usually when he gets to the witr people drop out they say I'll pray at home only because they don't want to put their hands up they don't want to be tested like that. So if they know it's going to be short, they're going to stay and get the reward of praying the whole night. Uh, the sunnah is to eat and drink a light suhoor for Fajr's brink. So it is from the sunnah to eat and drink until right before the salah. And they say the time distance between that was about the amount of time it would take for someone to recite 50 ayah. And 50 ayah, that's kind of general because 50 ayah from where? 50 ayah from Baqarah is pretty long, you know? But 50 ayah from Juz Amma is pretty fast. So if you go through the middle surah, there's not much time right before Fajr. So we used to see this thing back in the 80s. There was a thing, a chart, they used to say the Imsak. They used to have this thing on the calendar sack and you're supposed to stop like an hour before the salah comes in and you can't eat anymore this is not from the sunnah the prophet وسلم, he told us that there will always be good there will always be khair in the ummah as long as we delay the suhoor as long as we put it off till it's close to the time of fajr and we are quick ajil we are quick to break our fast showing that there's no benefit there's no you know extra taqwa in making the fast longer than what it has to be that doesn't make you a better Muslim in fact what will make you a better Muslim is that you put it close to the time where it's almost time for the Fajr Salah and that time is not mahdud that time is not necessarily you know muhadid. what do you mean by that limit there's no limit on that time it's not been defined exactly the amount of time that is so we don't have a right we don't have a right to define it but what is easy for you to stop before or a little bit before the salah and Allah knows best? Before the time of the salah and Allah knows best. The sunnah is to eat and drink a light suhoor for Fajr's brink and then from sunrise till it's set, we fast and leave all nourishment. It's what, small, it's what strong Muslims have to do. So here it says strong Muslims. So it's only upon those people who are physically able to do so. Every year we get questions stating, what if I'm sick or what if I'm on medicine and if I don't take this medicine, I'm going to have this adverse effect. 
well then you don't have to fast because it's only upon the person who is physically sound meaning he is healthy and healthy means that you are without the need of this uh, extra you know s s what did we call this thing some drugs to help you stay and maintain stable now of course what that we fear Allah as much as we can so if you can do without this drug or this vitamin or whatever it is for that time period of fasting then it's encouraged for you to do that and I'm sorry if you can you have to but if you can't and it's going to have an adverse effect and only you and Allah know if it's going to have an adverse Islam is not like that we're not police it's not upon the Imam or anybody to investigate and find out whether you're lying or whether you're being you know deceitful or exaggerating that's between you and your Lord no one's job is to do that and you don't have to try to hide from us because we don't know the unseen the reason why fasting or one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we get such a great reward for fasting is because only Allah knows if we're fasting and we're leaving all this stuff up for Allah so he is the one that's going to reward us for fasting but if you're really sick if you really can't do without the drugs or whatever the thing is that you have to take then you do not have to fast the rule in the sharia is of what do you call it obligation drops with inability the obligation to follow a particular rule drops without ability for example when you don't have water to make wudu is there an obligation for you to make wudu I can't hear you. What? There's an obligation for you to make wudu. You can't find water? I can't. You better speak up. Speak. I don't whisper. Own your statement. Okay. What do you have to do if you cannot find water? What do you have to do? You make. Is tayammum wudu? No, it's not. It's tayammum. But let's say it's raining. You're in. What is Birmingham? Okay? And it's raining as it normally does, and you can't find some dry place because you're outside to make the, the tayammum. Now, do you have to make tayammum? <laughs> Let's say the drizzling stops. Okay? You can't make the wudu with the, uh, the, the raining water. It's, let's say the drizzling stops and it's just now wet. The walls are wet. You can't make tayammum on any, there's no dry substance. Do you have to make tayammu? Excuse me? The wall is wet. You can't make, there's nowhere to, you can make tayammu. There's no, excuse me? Find a puddle. No, it's, you're not, it's not obligatory. It's a good answer, but it's not obligatory for him to do that. And he might get sick from that. So it might be a madar. It might be something that says he cannot do that because it's dirty. Okay, all right, when he goes to do it, someone steps in it. Okay? So, it's not upon him then to make wudu or tayammum. You understand? Because he has no ability to do either. Do you understand how that goes? Likewise, if you didn't have enough clothes to cover your body and time for salah came in, what are you going to do? If you're a prisoner, you have to pray. Even if you didn't have enough clothes to cover your aura. The point I'm trying to make is that obligation drops with inability. So if you truly have no ability to fast, then it's not upon you to fast. That also includes elder people who become infirm. They, they don't have the same strength that they used to. I know when I'm walking down the street, I walk very fast, or I used to walk very fast. And no one would walk past me. When I was growing up, I would be walking down the street in New York. I never saw a person walk past me. Now the other day I was walking down the street in New York, I, I was moving, I was sweating. And this young girl, was walking past me like she was walking slow and I'm moving fast and she was burned out on the next block and I was like man how did this little girl walk past me because I'm not walking as fast as I used to so now people are passing me as I go through the street so my strength is not the same I know it doesn't look that way don't get jealous say to brother Kalo. now I'm teasing <laughs> Now, as we get older, our strength wanes. So sometimes the elderly, they cannot fast like they used to fast. 
and likewise the women, whether they're pregnant or breastfeeding. Sometimes a woman, when she's breastfeeding, she can fast, but it's going to decrease her milk. So she cannot fast because that's going to be a hardship for the child. Do you understand? So now she has to make up her fast. But if she is sick, if she fasts, it's going to make her sick. Because some women, if they're breastfeeding, if they don't eat, they themselves get sick. Headaches, stomach aches, because the child is eating literally from their bone marrow. And that's why sometimes women get osteoporosis because they don't eat enough when they're in those um, child-rearing years. So if this is the case, then she doesn't have to fast because it's a hardship on her. She's like the infirm person and she has to do a fidya. You know, so here we have to see in the Sharia what case is followed by for whomsoever. So it's upon us what strong Muslims have to do, obligating me and you to intend the night before a day of fasting for our Lord. Now, does that mean we have to say, no way to an usal and assume God in inshallah? Do we have to say that? Do we have to make any words? Own your opinion. I can't hear you. Does anyone say yes? Okay. No, you don't say that. The knee is made, you know, it, it's, it's something that we have in our heart. It's clear in our head, made in our heart. We don't have to say anything. This is a type of innovation that has a place, because bid'ahs are different types, you know. This is an innovation that has a ruling in the Sharia, but we just do it in the wrong way. And so we just have to make clarification there. You make the intention in your heart, and as long as you say, you know, I'm going to fast, when we hear that, it's fat, that, that Ramadan's come in, I don't know how you guys do it here, where you guys send out an email or something? Yeah, the sabbatical, I look at the, the internet and, and all that stuff like that, you get a, a like Batman, beep, beep, beep. fasting tomorrow, you know. <laughs> and that, I mean, that's good. That's excellent, you know. That's really beautiful thing, you know. So... You know, you, you know you're going to fast. You don't have to say, okay, I'm going to fast tomorrow. You just know you're going to fast. So, obligating me and you to intend the night before a day of fasting for our Lord. But for the traveler or the sick, the obligation doesn't sick. And girls, when menses come your way, you must stop fasting right away. The Sahaba, when they traveled, sometimes they fasted and sometimes they didn't. I know some of this stuff is well known to you guys. You know, but I want to just reiterate some of it, you know, but sometimes we think that we have to fast, you know, some the all I might say it's better for you to fast if it's easier for you to fast. And if it's not easy for you to fast, then it's better for you not to fast. Again, the situation goes back to the individual. Okay, but the third, the real important thing here is not to look down on the person who's either fasting or not fasting. Okay, and there's a group of women nowadays, at least in the United States, they think that the Sharia is wrong and they put themselves up. They say they're strong enough to fast when they're mensing. This is a mistake on their part, you know, for the women. Um, I don't know where they get it from, but we have to make it clear to the ladies. There is no fasting for the lady that's on her menses or postpartum um, bleeding. There's no fasting whatsoever. And Allah knows best and we don't. So this idea is, is, I think it's been pushed in there by the Orientalists to try to say that there's inequality in Islam. And even one woman went so far, I don't know if you guys heard about it. She led the Salah and the bunch of men was behind, or there was a bunch of males behind her. I'm not going to disrespect the men and say there were some men behind her, but there were some males behind her following her in the Salah. May Allah guide us from these types of um, delusions. And it's one of the signs of the last day that people are going to have these delusions like that. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. When girls' momentous come that way, you will stop fasting right away. And those that make themselves throw up or sneak and eat, they should grow up. For those are two dumb, dirty tricks that break a fast, you'll have to fix. Okay, some people think that throwing up breaks your fast. Throwing up does not break your fast. However, making yourself throw up breaks your fast now what's the proof that throwing up does not break your fast can anybody tell me what are the things that break your fast how about that excuse me external food eating intentionally because if you eat 
and you didn't realize if your habit is to come in the house give salams get a drink of water and then go about your business and you came in one day unconsciously you said salams and you grabbed the water and you started to drink and he said salam takallah it's, it's Ramadan. You say, oh, subhanAllah. Then Allah fed you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fed you. Because you honestly forgot. And Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you see how he made something unintentional become such a beautiful thing? That we all want Allah to feed us. But it has to be honest. You have to honestly get fed by Allah. So you honestly forget. Allah fed you. What a beautiful thing to be fed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But those who pretend and sneak and eat, you know, these people, they have to grow up. You know, th th this is very childish. We expect this maybe from the small children who may be weak that way. But we don't expect this from the grown people. And we tell the young people, don't do this because when you get older, you're going to remember and you're going to make up that fast. Okay? So save your time now so that you don't have to make it up later up, make it later on. Because those are two dumb daily tricks that break a fast you'll have to fix. Allah don't need us not to eat if we still lie and act like creeps. So when we're fasting, we're not supposed to be... Yes, sir. I'm sorry? I'm so oh, yeah, I, I, I left that alone. Jazakallah khair. What are the things that break your fast? Jazakallah khair. Barakallah fikum. We said eating intentionally or drinking intentionally. What else? Come on, guys. Okay, making, having, enjoying yourself with your family, yes? Come on, this is, this is supposed to be simple things. What things break your fast? <coughs> no? Injections. Some people, if this is an injection that gives you nourishment. If it's an injection, anything that you enter into the body that's going to give you nourishment. It's going to in, feed your body, okay? Some people say about giving blood, but we don't have clarity. And we're not talking about things that there's not, not clarity on. We're talking about things that are clear. The proof that vomiting doesn't break your fast. Do you have a hadith saying that vomiting breaks your fast? Does anybody have a hadith? So in the absence of a, a delil, that is the delil. If there's no proof saying that it breaks your fast, who has the right to say something breaks your fast or not break your fast? Only two people here? All the rest of you guys have been fasting all your life. You don't know who's the one that de determines? Allah knows best, right? So if Allah hasn't told us this thing breaks your fast, who has the right to come afterwards and tell you that it breaks your fast? Excuse me? The Sunnah. What if the Prophet ﷺ didn't say it? Excuse me? Sorry? I can't hear him. Ijma, is there ijma? No. So, fa so breaking your fast by, you know, throwing up does not break your fast. Even bleeding, it does not break your fast. Some people say bleeding breaks your fast. It does not break your fast. You know, we have, you know, yes. Shouting, no. This does not break your fast either. It breaks the haba. What happens here, it breaks the attitude that you're supposed to have when you're fasting. Because what are you told to do when you get angry and, or someone disturbs you when you're fasting? What are you told to do? You're supposed to say, I'm fasting. I'm fasting. Because the also when you're fasting is that you're not talking too much. You're only saying what is necessary. So you go back and you focus on Allah. And you don't focus on that issue. That issue can wait till when you're not fasting. Whatever it is. Because right now you're fasting. And that time is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to focus on those other things. Did someone say something? Young man? Did you say something? Okay, no. On the side right there. Okay. So, does anybody else have anything else that they want to add? Yes. Toothpaste. Okay, now we get into an issue where there's difference of opinion. I say, Abu Tawbah says, don't use it, okay? Because the prophets, and I'm basing my statement on the statement of the Messenger of Allah that said, everybody, every king has a hima, you know, has a, a, a inviolable area. And you don't get close to that area, you get to the edge, you're playing games. I'm not, I'm not crossing the line, 
I'm not, and then you cross over the line. What's crossing over the line with toothpaste? If you swallow it, you broke your fast. Okay? If you swallow it, you broke your fast. So why go there? You want to brush your teeth? Take the water and brush your teeth with the toothbrush. If you, if you really have to, and then spit it out because you can catch the water quicker than you can catch the, 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 the silent taste of the toothpaste. Okay? Well, using the miswack itself, of course, that's lawful. But I'm talking about the modern day with miswack, which is the toothbrush with the toothpaste. This type of thing, in my estimation, Abu Tauba's estimation, you should leave it alone. Though some ulama, they say you can use it. But what do they put as a condition? That you don't swallow it, which is a very difficult thing to do. So that's why I suggest that you don't do it. Okay? Yes, sir. On perfume. You can wear perfume while you're fasting, but you shouldn't burn incense and it shouldn't be burned in the masjid. Okay? Bukhur. The legend of Da'im, the standing committee, they said that we shouldn't burn incense in the masjid even after we're finished fasting because the, the, the smoke might linger. And if this, if you inhale this, it has some type of ingredients in the, in, in the incense that is similar to eating. So if you inhale it, it breaks your fast. Okay? So we're, we, it's something we're suggested, it's a, it's a strong suggestion that will make it makru not to burn the incense. But wearing oil is a beautiful thing. You can wear oil while you're fasting. And it's also recommended while you're fasting to put oil on your face. Zayt zaytun or oil or lotion. Why is that? Somebody tell me why. Excuse me? Right, uslin in the origin, it says not to show off. Why? This is an alluding, this is alluring to the point that some people when they're, they're fasting, their skin looks dry. You say, what's wrong with you? I'm fasting. And they look, but we're not supposed to look like that. So we don't want to have the appearance of fasting. Okay? Because we're only doing it for Allah. So then we put oil on our faces, and if we don't have any hair on our head, you know, I'm teasing you. <laughs> no, I'm going to go. We put oil on, and we look nice. Put your nice clothes on. All throughout Ramadan, you should wear your best clothing. You should wear your best clothing. Every day should be like Jumu'ah. So when the Kufar see you, they say, man, you're looking mighty sharp today. Hmm. See, all the Muslims looking sharp. And when people look like that was shutting, everybody went, hey man, I, I like the way these guys look. It attracts them. And they may say, well, I want to look good too. You know, what's going on? Put me on. It's Ramadan. Oh, wow. You know, what's Ramadan? You know, and then you get into some conversation or something like that. You shouldn't, it's not Ramadan that you wear your most raggedy clothing. This is a time where we look our best, inshallah. Since we're asking questions, go ahead. My friend, what is it? The fitna of women. Allowing the gaze, is that what he said? Unlawful gaze, okay. Again, alhamdulillah, barakallah fikum. Fasting is more than just not staying away from food. Like I said, Allah does not, don't need us not to eat if we still lie and act like creeps. This is an alluring to the fact that fasting is more than just with the body, it's also with the heart, you know? And one of the things we fast from is from our lusts and our desires. The fasting of the eyes is what? Refusing to look at those things. You shouldn't, that's why you're not fasting sitting in front of the TV all day watching man la yuhibbul Fatima. You know, watching a TV program, who's the one that doesn't love Fatima and all these other Arabic programs that are dramas or whatever. If it's, it's Desi programs that have the same Bollywood and everything like that, a guy steals the girl and they're going, and you're watching this. What's going on? I'm fasting. I'm waiting for, you know, the that. Come on. You're just filling your head and your heart with this. This, it's, this defeats the objective because we know most of the stuff on the television is things that call our heart to ma'asiyah and, and fahsha, you know? So we should really stay away from those things. As far as the ladies in the street, 
and everything like that, we should definitely stay away from looking at those ladies. You know, nighttime in Ramadan, go to your wives. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has ordained us. And this satisfies the man. Just like if you were filled, if you drank, if I kept drinking and I kept drinking and I was drinking and I was full, can I take something else to drink? If I see someone, I'm like, nah, I'm, you know, I don't want any. I'm satisfied. I'm satiated. You know, likewise, if we satisfy our desires in a way that is lawful, we won't, it'll be easier for us when we go out and we walk through the streets. This is a, a plug for the fathers of these young ladies and these men to facilitate marriages and not wait till the brother becomes an engineer or something like that, but to make it easy for people to get married so they don't wait too late and then all of a sudden, you know, we have these messed up situations with the Muslim youth, you know? We don't want to, there's a great example, not trying to call a bad thing about Saudi Arabia, but we should all learn a lesson from Saudi Arabia and the, the qadiya of marriage. You know, there, if you look on the census, the world census now, it's going to take them a hundred years before they get into a, a growth plus again. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Did I explain that correctly? Okay. Every generation that comes after the next one is more people. Then there are some endangered peoples. Now, Saudi Arabians are now one of the most endangered peoples of the planet meaning they're close to extinction because of the high mahar that they've placed on the women that people haven't got married so a large percentage of their women have gone past childbearing age or at least to the point where they can have enough to make more population so if they go on and keep on going it'll take them a hundred years from now on no matter what they do in order to get a plus in their population growth. Do you understand what I mean by that now? And this is a direct response to us making this, you know, these humongous demands on people getting married. And so we should facilitate that and this would help in, unclick your fingers off. This would help, in helping the person fast from the eyes. One sheikh said, I think it was the Sheikh Waqiyah, and he was the, Rahimahullah, he was the sheikh of Imam al-Shafi'i. He said that Iman leaves through your eyes. He said Iman escapes from your eyes. And so this should be enough to scare us about what we're looking at, what we're viewing. Another sheikh, he was explaining the dangers of pornography, okay? He was saying the danger of pornography is that once you see it with your eye, your eye and the shaitan now plays a game and when you go to the salah, he shows it to you again. So you repeat the nadr even though you're not physically looking at it again. The intellect has a way of re-showing anything that it has seen. And it'll do it, the, the shaitan, his name is Khinzib. Khinzib, he does this right when you're in the salah. You know, when you say Allahu Akbar, shaitan runs away, right? Did you know that? When you call the aqama, he runs away. And he passes gas, farting real loud so he doesn't hear the adhan. But as soon as you say Allahu Akbar and you're in the salah, he comes right back and he starts to whisper to you. You've heard him. He tells you, you know, you last week you put your keys on the table. Yeah, it was under over here. And you know that sentence you was writing? This is the word you should put there. He starts reminding you of all types of stuff. You know, you can organize your books like this. And if you do like this, you remember you got to call your mother. Or to anything. Just to distract you. His whole job, Khinzib, is to distract you, to make you forget what raka'ah you on. And one of the tricks he does, he plays back man aladhi lam yuhibu al-fatima or whatever program that you saw on TV, he starts coming on, on in your head. Or some silly commercial. Or something else you saw that's not going to benefit you. So the fasting of the eyes is the not looking. Okay? Is there any more questions? Fadl. Remember not to sleep all day or talk too much with too much play. Here is an ishara to, he says, what about the people that sleep all day? They fast. I mean, they get up, they pray Fajr. Then they go to bed. 
They wake up, they go back to bed. They wake up, pray the Lord, go back to bed. Wake up, pray awesome, go back to bed. Then get up, take shower, get ready, go to the masjid, break the fast. This is, again, you can't play games with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not Jews. There is an example in us in watching the Jews. What did they do? They took the nets out and they threw it in the water on Saturday, on what, Friday night or whenever. So they said, we're not, we're not violating the Sabbath. We're not fishing. So the nets are out there gathering the fish and then they pull them in on Sunday or late Saturday night after the Maghrib goes down. We can't play games with the law. You ain't tricking. You khadi'oon Allah wa alladheena amanu. Allah says, wa min al-nasi man yuminu billahi wa bil-yawm wa man yaqulu amanna billahi wa bil-yawm al-akhir wa ma hum bimu'mineen. There are some people who say they believe in Allah on the last day and 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 ma hum bimu'mineen and they're not believers. You khadi'oon Allah wa alladheena amanu. They're trying to deceive and trick Allah. And they're trying to trick the believers. وَمَا يُخَادِعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ And they're not tricking anybody but themselves. So anybody who does that, come on, you know that. That's fasting, you have to go through the whole process. There is no microwave. There's no, no quick way out of it. You got to fast. And that's being up and spending the time. And that, the problem here is that if we stay up all night, if you stay up all night talking and playing and doing this stuff, doing other things, even if you're in the masjid doing it, you're doing something wrong. That's not what Ramadan's for. Let's have some discipline during Ramadan and focus on finishing that Quran. At least, did you guys know, we say we're Salafi. Everybody here says they're following the Sunnah, right? Am I correct? I'm in the right place? Okay, I'm gonna tell you something. Most of the Sahaba, most of the Sahaba, most of the Sahaba finished reading the Quran every seven days. Most of the Sahaba, most of the Sahaba, most of the Sahaba finished reading the Quran every seven days. Did you guys understand that? So we say we're going to follow the Sunnah, and this is not in Ramadan. This is normally, this was their normal practice. In Ramadan, it was increased. So if we say we're going to follow the Sunnah, let's follow the Sunnah in this, because we say we're following Quran and Sunnah. But we jump past that a lot of times, and we totally ignore that. Let's try our level best to read the Quran as much as we really can during Ramadan. Let make, let's make that our joint mission. Because that's part and parcel of Ramadan. Reading the Quran. And see how many times you can finish it. And see the effect that it has by you finishing it over and over again. And reciting it to your child. And having your child read it to you. And these things like that. These are practical things that will make landmark changes in your life. But there is no microwave. There's no quick way out. Sometimes we look at these adi'iyya and these, these adhkar and people think, well, I'm just going to say this and it'll be done. No. There's nothing, you know, you can just say and all of a sudden, magically, the day-to-day the -day work is just done. No. You have to do the work. So, for those who, you know, remember not to sleep all day or talk too much with too much play. So, again, fasting is supposed to have a type of haba, a type of attitude. You're not supposed to be playing and joking around. Allah's Messenger taught us without Ramadan. Man yu'min billahi wal yawm al-akhir, fal yaqul al-khair, aw la yasmut. Whoever believes in Allah on the last day, let him say that which is good or let him shut up. That's the language. So, we see this is not in Ramadan. So, it should be more done in Ramadan. We shouldn't be doing a whole bunch of chatty chatty. Talking about all types of things. Especially when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains what that word khair. فَلْيَقُولِ خَيْرْ أَوْ لِيَسْمَتْ خَيْرْ لَا خَيْرَ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِنْ نَجْوَاهُمْ There's no khair in most of your private conversations. 
Except the one who's Amara bis Sadaqa, who's ordering the people to do some type of charity. And that could be anything, whether it's monetary or with your body or anything like that. Aw ma'ruf, something that is easily recognized as good, which is the Sharia. Aw islahim bayna nas, or rectifying the, the situations between the teacher, the, 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 the people, either teaching or helping out in some situation or another. That's khair. And Allah's message, Allah says, la khaira. There's no good whatsoever except in these things, in, in, in most of your, your private conversation. That's what a najwa is. A private conversation so remember not to you know too much talk too much talk during Ramadan we try to say don't make your personal speech outdo the recitation of Quran that you've done for the day okay read more Quran than you've said with your own words because you really don't have much to say okay or too much play again playing games too much this is Ramadan it's time for us to focus on the issues of the heart you should be making tadabbur thinking trying to make istighfar focusing on this month the rewards are adaaf are increased so you should be making as much tawbah think about your sins think about the bad character that you have and try to get it out try to think about it and ask Allah to remove it from you and remove it from your family these are the things that you, and of course the prophet was nice he was kind, he was generous during Ramadan. So you want to be the best person because this, this during the time frame that we have in Ramadan, all the rewards are ad'af. Yes, sir. Can you clear your ears? As far as we know, yes, you can clear, clean your ears, you can clean your nose, you can wash, you know, you can do all these type of things, you can shave. Yeah, well, it should, you should pull, you know, the, no, I'm, I'm serious. You should, instead of shaving, you should pull, and it's easy to pull. You just get the wax, pull it off like that, and shave. You can do all these types of things during the daytime in Ramadan. And, and the reason why I say that, because, you know, the, the, the kufar, the, the ladies and stuff like that, they wax in areas to show their privates and everything like that. And we have a sunnah to pull it out, and the modern way of doing that is with waxing. So that's closer to the, the letter of the law. But, of course, if you can't, but we, most of us haven't tried to do it. We have to be very crafty in actually applying the, 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 the Sharia, you know, and not think that it's, it's, no, 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 I have to shave. Nah, it increases manhood, as, as the ulama say. It's one of the things that increases your muru'ah. You know, you do it, Allahu <laughs> Akbar. No, no, we're, it's not guilt, astaghfirullah. I didn't mean it that way. He said, okay, we all have been visited by khinzib. The reason why I mentioned it, when that happens in the salah, you're not guilty of anything. It's khinzib. His job, he's a particular devil whose name is khinzib. Learn him. Allah's Messenger told us everything we need to know. Khinzib's job is to distract us in the salah. He's the whispering devil that comes and tells you all types of things while you're in salah just so you can make sajjah to sahwa. He doesn't want you to make sajjah to sahwa. He just wants you to forget. Okay? That's his, his whole thing. To not focus and to lose the ajr, the reward of your salah. So Allah told us how to get rid of him. Anybody know? I cannot hear you. You have to speak up there like a proper British man. No, not to remember death. Barakallah fikum. Man. No, no, I'm calling out, man. No, 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 not you. I want a young man, yes. Yes, with the kufi. Look at your left? No. Get out of here. And watch. Let me, yes, young man. Ignore him? That's a good way you try. Yes, sir. He said, spit three times to the right and then spit three times to the left. Close, but no. Barakallah fikum. Yes, young man in the back. There you go. Barakallah fikum. Takbir. Astaghfirullah. Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah. The young man in the back, he wins. He said, you look to your left and you spit three times to your left. Okay? You spit. But you're not. 
You, you know, I feel sorry for them, but you spit three times to the left, okay? And this is what Khinzib does. He does all types of notorious little games, you know, to try to, he even tells you, you know, you pass gas. But when you, if he says that, tell you, look, you know, I don't hear it, I don't smell it, you're lying. That's what Allah's Messenger told us. You don't hear it, you don't smell it, say he's a liar. Tell yourself, shit, you're a liar, stop lying, you know? I tell them, you, you really should get a different job, you know? Because we, we are exposed. I know who you are now. And so what it does now is we, it increases us in our remembrance of Allah, not in forgetting Allah, okay? And it makes me feel at least, and I encourage you to say that, I must be doing something right right now for him to be here, okay? So spit through the three times and he's gone. He might come right back. He's he persistent. But this is our jihad in the salah. Okay? That we focus our, our, try to get our total focus just to try to get two raka'ah in our whole life just focused on Allah. Just those two. If we can get that. And that is an amazing thing to try to get. Yes. Say, I don't know that you have to say that before. Allah knows best. Does, does anybody know? That, I don't know that, that you have to say that. What I do know is that you turn to the left and you spit three times. And then you, you continue your salah. Yes. You have to speak up, young man. It's a beautiful question. He says, can we do it before salah? Can we start off by spitting off to the left three times and then start? No. The answer is a very good question. But the answer is no, because the prescription is after the, salah, after the salah begins, okay? But what you do before the salah is you make the iqama real loud. I notice here, in, not in this particular place, but nowadays people call the iqama, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu Allah. No, you're supposed to make the, um, of course, if you're making salah by yourself, you don't come in and start saying, Allahu Akbar, Allah. No, but you, when you're by yourself and not in the message, you should make the, the iqama kind of loud because anything that hears you the glass the water the the microphone the fan the ceiling the lights every inanimate object that hears you is going to bear witness for you yom al qiyamah that you call the akama and you want as much witnesses for khair as you can get so you raise your voice in calling the akama to get them and this also is going to make him run further away and make him take more time to come back but he will come back, inshallah ta'ala. Yes, sir. I didn't hear. You have to start again. All right. I guess he could. Yes. Naam. Alhamdulillah. He made. Jabarakallah. Mashallah. He brought together. <laughs> he did, he said, the narration that you're referring to is used in when you're sleeping at night and you're visited by a nightmare. Remember, nightmares are from shayateen. They're just jinns that come into your dreams and try to, you know, make you do something haram or scare you. That's why, and even the kufar know this, when they show their ghosts, boo, right? To scare you. They try to lighten it up because they want you to like these things. But the whole concept is the same, that the shayateen try to scare you. And so, when the shaitan comes to you in, in the dreams, what you can do, if you be woken up by that, is spit to your left saying, A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan and spit. However, what is stronger to do, and Allah knows best, as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said, if you visit at nighttime and you're having a nightmare, get up and pray two raka'ah. Get up and offer some salah. This will de de this is so detestable to the shaitan, he doesn't want you to wake up anymore. Okay? Because his trick only made you increase in your ibadah. And again, just to make another mention, sometimes people don't stand up at night and pray because they don't want to stand up at night and pray. They say, I'm tired, I can't do it. Is standing in the salah wajib for the non-obligatory salah? Question. Is standing in the salah an obligation in the salah that's not fard? Come on, somebody ask him, answer me. 
What's the proof? No, I want the young man. Sorry. If I get a young man, I got to take him. Go for it. What's the, what, what, give me something more than that. That's it's true. Yes. Thank you. There it is. The Prophet ﷺ prayed while he was riding on his riding beast. Okay? And so, when you're riding on a riding beast, are you standing? I mean, in some places they may do that, but for the most part, you are sitting. So, here's proof that you can pray sitting down in the non-obligatory salah. So, if you're tired at night time, first let me say, it doesn't have the same reward as standing, but it beats a blank. It beats the laying down, sleeping, and not getting up at all. So if you start up at night, you say, you know, I'm tired. I mean, Allahu Akbar. And then you sit down and you offer your salah, if you're that tired. Okay? What you'll find out is if you commit to just that much, you'll wind up standing up a little bit more. You know, it'll become easier for you. And if you sit the whole time, then you get a reward for praying, even if you prayed sitting down. Now, praying sitting down, it beats sleeping not getting up at all because what happens if you sleep the whole night and you never get up for salah what did the messenger of allah tell us happens yes young man no 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 that's a different narration he said in your grave you're going to get your head smashed that's if you memorize some portion of quran and then you forget because you don't reread it and practice it. Then in the grave, a shaitan is going to be smashing your head with a rock. Then he's going to go get it again and smash your head again. Put your right hand up and I'll call on you. Yes, sir. What does he say? No, no. The shaitan does that anyway. Whether you stay up at night or not, the shaitan is going to try, try three knots on your head every night. Okay? But that's a good answer. Tabarakallah. What happens if you sleep the whole night and you don't get up and pray? Not even one raka'ah. Yes, young man. Right. The shaitan urinates in your ear. Excuse me? Oh, he said, oh, I'm sorry. I thought he said ties three nights. I couldn't hear. Some bass in the voice, young man. Alhamdulillah. I'm sorry. Yes. The shaitan urines in your ear. That's nasty, right? Who wants shaitan to urine in their ear? Put your hand up. <laughs> I didn't think so. We have to remember that we actually believe in the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he's told us the truth. The shaitan urines in people's ear if they sleep the whole night without praying. Without getting up to pray. And that's something that is pretty nasty. We don't know the effect of it, but we know we don't want to do that. So this should be an encouragement for us to get up at least pray a little bit of salah one raka'ah at night time just get up and pray the witch you know and then go back to bed and you don't even have to stand the whole time you could just start standing up and then sit down even if you don't want to go any place you know the prophet prayed on his bed standing up on his bed sallallahu alaihi wasallam and do you know that hadith yeah we do because when he would come down what would Aisha do pull her legs back right so he's praying on his bed, standing up on his bed. I tried that. My wife told me, no, don't do it again. <laughs> but my, my bed, I think our bed is a little thicker, you know, standing up like that. Alhamdulillah. Okay, I work backwards. To answer the easy question, if you're traveling, there is no obligation to fast. Okay? So if you're, that's just clear. So if you're going to another place, even if you're not traveling abroad, if you're traveling to London, that's not Birmingham. You're traveling. You can shorten your salah. You don't have to fast. You understand? And it might be even, probably traveling to London is probably harder, or, you know, than traveling out the country with the traffic and all of the different, you know, difficulty that it is to do certain things. So be realistic like that. So the other question is a very good question he says that what if you curse you backbite you slander you steal you look at pornography you do everything except eat during ramadan is your fast still valid 
Allah knows best if it is. But what we know for sure is that when you do things that are take away from your salah, I mean take away from your fasting, so, so much so, what might be left? Allah knows best because we don't know the reward of fasting. So Allah said He's giving the reward, right? So I would say don't stop fasting. If the person gets up and he's fasting and he curses and he does all these other things, he's still better than the person that's not fasting. You know? And maybe his act of worship will help him. Not maybe, it's true. You know, that it will help him. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and the salah, in the salah, tanha an al fashai wal munkar. You know? So these things will help discipline him. I know some people who used to break their fast with a beer in New York. You know? But these people are the same people who would tell us a lot about Islam when we were growing up. They were very pretty ignorant, but that they would they'd be fasting and standing there talking about Islam with a 40 ounce in their hand. You know, that was some years ago. Those people now are not like that. You know, so it may not see the result of their fasting right away. But if that person is consistent, we have good hopes for him. Wallahu a'lam. There is a person that came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, he was an old man. He said, what do you say about a person who has committed every crime Allah has said not to and the Prophet Sallallahu looked up at him noticing that it was an elder man he said spend the rest of your life doing good it'll be a kifayah to wipe out what you came before what came before it he said even if the man was deceitful and treacherous and the Prophet said even if the man was deceitful and treacherous and the man turned around and said, Allahu Akbar. And he was slow walking away and every step he was saying, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And he kept saying Allahu Akbar till he went out of sight. So we have good hopes that, you know, our last of our deeds are better than our beginning deeds. And that our, we increase in our understanding. And we never want to be sanctimonious. You never want to be, you know, that mentality, holier than thou, and make the mistake by saying, I'm lying, never going to forgive you. You know, how could you? This type of, we don't know what we're going to have tomorrow, what our situation is going to be in. Because Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to get up and pray and make his stick fall 70 to 100 times a day. And one time when he was praying, Aisha radiallahu anha, she saw how he was doing. She said, Why ain't Ya Rasulullah? You, you doing all, all this, Ya Rasulullah? Like, come on, you know, you're, you're the prophet. And so when he finished, he said, Man, you are ya Aish. He said, Who told you that I was safe, Aisha? And the hearts, Wal Kulu, Baina Sabir Rahman, and the hearts are between the fingers of a Rahman. He twists them and he turns them any way he likes. And we see the, the, the dua that the Prophet ﷺ was making all the time. Ya muqallibul qulubu wal absar. O the one who turns and flips the hearts and the visions. Thabbit qalbi ala deenik or fi deenik. Make my heart firm in your religion, in your deen. So we need to constantly be careful not to think that we're safe. And Another narration that tells us not to be safe or look down on someone else's sins is a narration that the two people, one used to see someone doing bad and the other one was doing the bad and he used to say, look, ittaqillah. And then the other one said, khalli wa rabbi, leave me alone. You ain't, have you been sent down here to be my you know, guardian to watch everything I do? Mind your business. Leave me with my Lord. And then the other one would constantly remind them, ittaqillah. Constantly said, mind your business. You ain't, you ain't been sent here to watch after me. Do you. Leave me with my Lord. Let me worry about that. And then finally, the one who was doing good deeds and working, making ibadah said, you know, لَنْ يَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لَكَ أَبَدًا Big serious words. Allah will never forgive you for what you did. He said that, ever. And Allah caused both of them to die. It's a famous hadith. And then he raised them back up. And he said to the one who had done all those good deeds, and was making all this ibadah. Who 
gave you the authority to speak on my behalf and say what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do. It's big. So we can understand how Allah looks at it. Who told you what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do? Verily, I've forgiven that person. And I've wiped away all of your good deeds. So this one was forgiven and the one his good deeds was wiped away and he was taken to hell. So we learn from this that a man says a word, just one statement, even just a, a word. He thinks it's something, no big deal, but it may be something that makes him go to hell. So we always have to be careful and, you know, remember that we're not dead ourselves. And we hope, we hope that we're not those people that Allah's Messenger so, 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 so Allah spoke about who do the deeds of the people of paradise to their only one hand span away and then the qadr of Allah happens upon them the defect that Allah knew he, 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 in them comes to effect and they do the deeds of the people of the hellfire and they fall in it there are some people like that and no one has told us that we're not those people you know no one here is secure from being one of those people we always put ourselves, because of our ego, on the other side of the people that are doing the bad deeds and we're going to get into the Jannah. But we could be those people who do good deeds and then finally get, do the thing in the health, the, the deeds of the people that are hellfire and fall into the hellfire. May Allah protect us from that. So we should ask Allah to make us our feet firm on this deen. Yes, sir. Jazakumullah khair. Yes, I mentioned that the traveler does not have to fast. But I did, I neglected, astaghfirullahaladzim, wa jazakumullah khair, that the traveler has to make up those fasts. It's just not free days for him. He has to make them up as soon as he can. But he has until he dies. Is there any other questions? Going light along to end. Then soon as you can't see the sun from way up high, the fast is done. The devil loses and we win. Oh Allah, forgive our sins. The thirst is gone, the veins are wet. We hope that the reward is set. Like this we pray before we eat. Then bismillah or bismillah to start the feast. Here, as soon as we should be from a high position and so we can see. Because if you're in a low position, the sun might have gone over the mountain or over the, 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 the building, but it's still up. And it also shows as soon as the sun goes over the horizon, goes down, even though this light from the sun can still be seen, as soon as the sun cannot be seen, the fast is over. Okay? And so then as soon as it's done, your fast is done. And then we, it's a good time to make dua. Ask Allah to forgive you your sins. Again, ask Allah, there's a particular dua to make, you know, when we, we get to this particular point. And then uh, after that, we break our fast immediately. Again, you don't make a whole bunch of time. Go ahead and break your fast. Don't delay it. First with dates or water if there are no dates to break it with. The Prophet ﷺ told us to break our fast with dates. Now we may come up with a lot of scientific reasons why, you know, eating the dates is good for the, you know, body when you eat them and then the sugar comes in there. But this can be said about any fruit. But the Prophet ﷺ didn't say any fruit. So if you don't have dates, it's not better that you eat an apple or you eat a pear or something else or you eat an orange. No. If there's no date, then the next best thing is water. We're following the Sharia, not science. Okay? We're following the Sharia. And the reward is in following the Sharia, not science. So if there's no dates, then water. If there's no water, then with any sweet. Now you have the choice. But you go through the first two choices, and it's not your choice. I'm going to drink the water. No. Eat the date. Okay? Then, if you want if, your water. Okay? And after that, any sweet. But do not wait to start to eat. This is a mistake. This is, this is aglabiya. Okay? Do not wait to start to eat. And if you're fast, took a break for sickness or for travel sakes, you have to make it up. And if you don't, you have to pay. Some of the, if you don't, meaning like sometimes uh, the women, they go for years without praying the whole month of Ramadan because of their situation. And it's the way Allah created them. And some of them have to, they have to make up these days. Sometimes they get so much, they get fatawa from the different ulama, and Allah knows best. 
And they say, okay, well, if you have over this amount of days now, you can pay and make up these days like this. We follow our ulama, and they know best after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so if you have a lot of days to make up, and you listen to the different fatawa of the ulama with regards to that, and because sometimes the women they make it very difficult for them if they have been having babies after babies or they're breastfeeding and stuff like that. Some years go by, but they don't get the whole month in, and Allah knows best. This is what I had to offer with the brothers. Jazakumullah khair. Astaghfirullah alladhi la tadiyya wa da'ih. I'm traveling after this, inshallah. I'm traveling. Yeah. And I'll see you guys, inshallah. Lahiqan.